In the late 1800s, thousands of clay tablets were discovered, revealing an ancient library of texts describing the original myths behind the largest world religions today. And many of these stories involve a great celestial battle between deities. Today, many believe that these tablets actually are describing a great calamitous event between two planets in our early solar system. The legendary Marduk, known commonly today as Nibiru, and Tiamat, the watery pearl. Nibiru sailed into our solar system from afar and almost entirely destroyed Tiamat. This event caused Nibiru to become locked into a long elliptical orbit in our solar system and also gave birth to our moon, the asteroid belt, and put the Earth in the position that it's in today, between Mars and Venus. The question remains, is this story accurate? Is there actually any evidence to support this theory? And what other ideas are out there that could explain this ancient myth? Let's find out. Opening up the research on Nibiru, well, there's literally a mountain of information available. And digging into it, you'll find everything from, of course Nibiru is real, all the way to, uh, did you just use the word Nibiru in a sentence? Are you serious? Now, we feel that an open-hearted exploration is always the best practice. And so we're gonna do our best to cover as much information as we can. Take a deep breath, because it's a lot. And one final thing before we get started, Regarding the name between Nibiru and Marduk, from now on, we're just gonna use the name Nibiru for this possible distant planet. And the reason for this is because there's another theory we'll look at that explores a different version of the Marduk and Tiamat battle, of which associates Marduk with the planet Mars. As always, we encourage you to practice critical thinking and discernment with everything we discuss as we open our minds and explore this together. Now, the search for a larger planet beyond Neptune has been going on since the discovery of Neptune in 1846, when observed anomalies in the orbit of Uranus suggested another large planet lay farther out. In 1906, the term Planet X was coined by Percival Lowell, the founder of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, when he began his search for this distant planet. In 1930, Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto at the Lowell Observatory, but it was not big enough to be what they were looking for. In 1984, scientists thought that our sun could actually have a companion, a theoretical small dwarf star, which they called Nemesis, which could explain and cause the gravitational anomalies they were witnessing. However, to this day, no dwarf star has been found. In 1992, refined calculations showed that the mass of Neptune was 0.5% smaller than assumed, and thus the discrepancies in Uranus's orbit were dismissed as incorrect, and the need for a planet X went away. Then, in 1999, astronomers observed curious anomalies in the gravity and movement of certain comets in the outer solar system, and they theorized that a Jupiter-sized planet, which they called Tyche, lurked in the far reaches of our solar system. Later, in 2003, Sedna was discovered, a small exoplanet whose strange 12,000-year orbit indicated that something massive, well beyond Pluto, was altering Sedna's path. Jumping to 2014, an all-sky survey from WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer satellite, ruled out the existence of any planets larger than Saturn orbiting our sun at a distance of about 10,000 astronomical units, or AU. This is a ridiculously far distance, considering that one AU is the distance between the Earth and the sun. This put an end to the theory of Tyche. However, since Saturn is larger than Neptune, and Nibiru is said to be about the size of Neptune, the WISE satellite would not have registered a planet smaller than Saturn if it had scanned one. In January of 2016, two well-respected planetary scientists 
Constantine Batigan and Mike Brown of the California Institute of Technology discovered what they believed to be a large, roughly Neptune-sized planet in the outer reaches of our solar system. This planet is well beyond Pluto, and many are now calling it Planet X or Planet 9. This planet has not yet been seen, but advanced technology shows that without a doubt, something is out there. The planetary body is fully detectable through observations of six other previously discovered objects that orbit beyond Neptune all of which appear to cluster around a singular, larger body, with only a 0.0007% chance that this clustering is just a coincidence. What astronomers currently believe is that this planet-sized object has a rather interesting elliptical orbit, ranging anywhere from between 600 and 1200 AU to as close as 200 AU. With the exception that researchers don't currently calculate this planet traveling anywhere near Jupiter or the asteroid belt, the rest of the evidence appears to match what we've heard about Nibiru's path and influence. To that end, however, we theorize that if this planet is actually Nibiru and it's been orbiting our solar system for millions or billions of years, then it's possible that its orbit has rounded out over time, becoming less sharp and stabilizing into a more centered and wide curved orbit farther and farther out. Regardless of whether this planet is Nibiru or not, these two amazing planetary scientists Mike and Constantine have acknowledged that no one will believe in this planet until it actually appears in the telescopic viewfinder, and they are working hard to make viewing this planet a reality. At this moment, however, current telescopic technology, such as the Hubble Space Telescope or the 10 meter Keck telescopes in Hawaii have extremely tiny fields of view. Looking for this planet X manually would be like looking for a needle in a field of haystacks by peering through a drinking straw. Curiously though, when we compare the story of the great celestial battle to what currently exists in our solar system, we find a number of anomalies that may point to Nibiru's existence. While we've touched on these briefly before, let's go over them more thoroughly now. The first anomaly, the asteroid belt. Towards the end of the 18th century, even before Neptune had been discovered, several astronomers demonstrated that the planets were placed at certain distances from the sun, according to some definite law. The suggestion, which came to be known as Bode's law, convinced astronomers that a planet ought to be revolving in a place where hitherto no planet had been known to exist. That is, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. In the position where Tiamat was said to have been in our solar system, today we find a large belt of floating rocks that we call the asteroid belt. Upon closer inspection, the asteroid belt is a mashup of a variety of rocky minerals and water. There's actually a ton of frozen water in this belt, including a small dwarf planet named Ceres, which is at least in part a giant ball of frozen water. In fact, there's so much water on Ceres that astronomers believe it has even more water than the Earth does. Is it possible that the asteroid belt itself is the remnants of an ancient planetary cataclysm? However, taking account of the mass of the asteroid belt itself, it doesn't seem like there's quite enough matter in it to fill three quarters of a Neptune sized planet. The amount of mass in the belt is only about 4% of the mass of the moon. And so that leaves a lot of matter missing. There are two main things we can think of that could account for this. First, that a rather large majority of planet matter from Tiamat was blasted off into space, free of any planetary orbit and only a small amount of the remnants of Tiamat actually survived to form the asteroid belt. Second, and perhaps even more likely, is that if Nibiru kept coming back through the solar system for a long time, every time it passed through the asteroid belt, it would probably throw a ton of asteroids out as it passed through, leaving much less there than there originally was. The second anomaly, the moon. The moon is a huge piece in this puzzle. The most popular theory about the origins of the moon today is that it was created in some sort of massive collision. This leading theory is called the giant impact hypothesis, which suggests that the moon was formed out of the debris left over from a collision between Earth and an astronomical body the size of Mars approximately 4.5 billion years ago. This theory goes on to state that the moon is likely made up of matter from both the Earth and the body that crashed into it, causing a thorough mixing of material from both parent bodies. This theory is favored by scientists regarding the creation of the moon 
because of a body of evidence, including that the Earth's spin and Moon's orbit have similar orientations, and that Moon samples indicate the surface was once molten. Further, and coinciding with the first anomaly, there is the discovery of water on the Moon, but not just on it, in it also. Lunar astronauts from the 1970s had collected these tiny glass beads left over from ancient volcanic eruptions. And recent investigations into these beads found that little bits of water were actually hiding inside them. Researching this further has given rise to the idea that these volcanic deposits are indeed widespread and that the material inside the moon is significantly wetter than previously thought. Together, both the cataclysm and the water on the moon supports the theory that the moon began as a fragment of Tiamat. Perhaps one day, we'll know for sure. The third anomaly, Pluto. Scientists today have no solid explanation for why Pluto's orbit is so irregular. Where most of the planets travel along the same plane in a near circular ellipse, Pluto's orbit is significantly wider on top of that, Pluto doesn't travel on the same plane as the other planets, but moves at an angle dipping significantly above and below the celestial plane. There are theories that suggest Pluto was once a moon of our other planets or a part of the Kuiper belt, but nothing has ever been definitively proven on the subject. That said, this interpretation of the Sumerian tablets suggests that it was once a moon of Saturn and that a rogue planet caused it to careen out into a distant orbit. Perhaps this idea actually has some merit, considering it mirrors what modern theorists put forth today. The fourth anomaly, Uranus. A recent surge of articles online inspired global curiosity by announcing research and simulations indicating that Uranus was most likely smashed in a giant collision in the development of our early solar system. You see, Uranus is especially strange compared to all of the other planets. While all of the planets are tilted in some way or another, Uranus appears to be on its side with a whopping 98 degree tilt. The researchers responsible for this recent investigation said, our findings confirm that the most likely outcome was that the young Uranus was involved in a cataclysmic collision with an object twice the mass of Earth, if not larger, knocking it to its side and setting in process the events that helped create the planet we see today. In addition to its tilt, the collision is said to be responsible for Uranus's unique rotation rate, atmosphere, internal structure, and warped magnetic field. If we look at their simulation, it shows what the collision actually could have looked like. Now, of course, this isn't directly what has been interpreted from the stories, which suggested that Nibiru's gravity pulled matter away from Uranus. That is, unless Nibiru actually crashed through Uranus on its way through the solar system. I would also love to know if it's possible for a strong gravitational force acting upon Uranus to have a similar resulting effect on the blue planet. Of course, at this point, we really only have theories and simulations, but one thing is for certain, Uranus is a distinct planet with a whole lot of mystery around it. The fifth anomaly, the Earth-Neptune size ratio. The stories suggest that Tiamat was roughly the size of Neptune and that it was chunked in half and then in half a second time, after which one of those chunks flew off into a new orbit and became the Earth. If this is correct, then the Earth would be somewhere around four times smaller than Neptune is today. We know that the diameter of the Earth is about 12,742 kilometers and the diameter of Neptune is about 49,244 kilometers. If we divide 49,224 by 12,742, we get 3.86. This makes the Earth almost four times smaller than Neptune is. Of course, this is all only based on approximation because we don't 100% know what the size of Tiamat actually was. But based on the suggestion that it was roughly Neptune sized, the numbers generally seem to fit. I'd like to conclude this exploration of our anomalies simply by saying that while we've just covered these today, there is certainly an abundance of information out there that would lend itself to this conversation. And I would love to extend this investigation to everyone watching. Together, there's no mystery we can't solve. And in the spirit of scrutiny, it's time we took a hard look at the person responsible for these stories, Zechariah Sitchin himself. 
Perhaps one of the most important topics when opening the box on Nibiru is the question of the translation of the tablets and the accuracy of Zechariah Sitchin's interpretations. To some, Sitchin was a brilliant scholar with revolutionary ideas about the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian gods. To others, he was a pseudoscientist and pseudo-historian with delusional thinking. Sometimes people even claim he was a Freemason or sent by the Illuminati specifically to mess with us. Regardless, it's clear that his ideas have changed the way that many people view human life, human nature, and our role in the cosmos. When Sitchin first began his work, there were very few people in the world who actually read or understood Sumerian cuneiform, and this still remains true today. To say it's not a common dialect today is a massive understatement. In 2006, a book titled Sumerian Lexicon was published, which helped provide guidance for those seeking to decipher the Sumerian texts. Since then, a number of academics have spotted inaccuracies in Sitchin's translations. Some of these inaccuracies are perhaps interpretive as well, as Sitchin tends towards literalism, both in how he perceives images and words. Certain scholars also contend through literal interpretation that Sitchin ignores known historical and mythological contexts in favor of his own views. For example, Sitchin is very famous for pointing to a seal called Cylinder Seal VA243, which depicts an image of a circle surrounded by 11 smaller circles. This, according to Sitchin, is an image of our solar system as the story is told in the tablets. Critics, however, point out that the image of the sun in the center is not the sun, because when compared to hundreds of other tablets that depict the sun, the image is different, usually depicting a star with either six or eight points. Although in this first tablet we looked at, there is a six-sided star around the central circle. Further, critics point out that there is nowhere in any other text in Sumerian or Mesopotamian tablets that suggest the Sumerians knew that there were more than five planets. A man named Michael Heiser, one of the leading debunkers for Sitchin's work and the author of SitchinIsWrong.com, describes that the circles may represent some star cluster or relate with some deity connected with fertility due to the other information on the same tablet. He also suggests that it could describe the 12 member council of the Mesopotamian gods called the Anunnaki, but he insists that it's absolutely not a solar system. What do you think? Do you believe this could be a solar system? Please share your thoughts about it in the comments. Now, Michael Heiser has presented a great deal of information on his numerous websites explaining his theories of the Sumerian tablets, how Sitchin is wrong, and what he believes the tablets actually say. But of course, with every debunker, there's a debunker for that debunker. And a man named Eric Vandenberg published a document titled Heiser is Wrong in response and explains that due to Michael being a fundamentalist Christian, his perspectives on the tablets usually attempts to place the stories inside a worldview that fits with his own Christian perspective. Eric breaks down a number of ways that Sitchin was actually correct, despite Michael Heiser saying he wasn't. One example is that according to Heiser, there is not a single Sumerian text that associates the Anunnaki with Nibiru and he then challenges ancient astronaut theorists to show him such a text. He encourages investigators to use the online electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature or ETCSL to do the research. However, according to the ETCSL, not only are the Anunnaki found in or associated with Nibiru, but they are found there quite frequently. Though this is not to suggest that Nibiru is explicitly a planet, the discussion about what Nibiru is, is definitely still up in the air. We'll post links in the comments so that you can read the work of both of these men and decide for yourself what you choose to believe. Again, we always want to remind everyone to practice healthy skepticism and discernment when looking over the information. Of course, it's obvious that no ancient translation is going to be 100% accurate about everything, especially when there are so many renditions of the various stories across history. Not to mention, if the ETCSL or Sumerian Lexicon book got even a small number of translations incorrect, it could lead to huge amounts of information being interpreted wrong, or at least very different from its original intention. Speaking of interpretations, it's important that we recognize the version we have been exploring of the Tiamat and Marduk battle as these planets is only one interpretation, and there are others out there just as compelling. 
I'd love to take a moment now to explore another version that is extremely interesting, which is found within the electric universe theory. Spearheaded by the Thunderbolts project, this theory has been rapidly growing in popularity lately, which describes the entire universe as electrically connected. It explains that the sun isn't actually a nuclear fusion reactor as we've believed for so long, but is essentially a massive electric ball of plasma powered by these galactic electrical currents that spiral out through the arms of the galaxy in a pattern that looks very much like Fibonacci. It's very relatable if we consider stars to streetlights drawing energy from power lines, where the power plant is the galactic center. Further, these electrical currents create not only stars, but all forms of material bodies, from small hard asteroids and planets to giant balls of gas like Jupiter and Saturn. The theory describes that these gas giants are far more connected to stars than we realize though, because if they are in alignment with the cosmic electrical lines, they can ignite into a star, just like a light bulb filament, which becomes red hot and glowy when you run power through it. This theory explains some other things too. Take lightning, for example, Despite the modern belief that lightning is formed in the clouds, scientifically speaking, this is still a mystery that is not well understood. The Thunderbolts project has put forth a new model, suggesting that clouds are a conductor for the planetary and galactic electricity all around us. The theory also explains gravity, which today is one of the biggest mysteries in science, and yet which a great deal of physics is based on. And they've suggested it's simply a phenomenon caused by the electrical charge of an object. The fundamentals of the electric universe theory wildly transforms our perspective of the entire cosmos. And in many ways, the model makes a lot of sense. It's likely that this was the understanding that Tesla had when he designed and constructed his amazing technologies. But what's especially interesting about the electric universe theory is that it's a multifaceted approach to cosmology. On one hand, we see these theoretical physics explaining natural phenomenon with electricity, which is its own distinct exploration. On the other hand, it attempts to take into account the mythos of the world and hypothesize how the electric universe theory fits into our ancient history. They make special note that there are a number of ancient stories around the world describing the battle of the dragon, which of course includes Tiamat and Marduk. To them, it all begins with our earth Mars, and a brown dwarf star. Please keep in mind that there are a lot of variations available out there, and today we're simply going to cover the basic idea. The theory begins by suggesting that not long ago in Earth's history, we had an entirely different sun altogether. It was a brown dwarf star, which was a free-floating activated gas giant moving through space on its own. Along with Mars, we traveled with it, held to its orbit by a strong electromagnetic field, most likely held underneath it in a fixed position. Diagrams have been produced to explain how this works using Birkeland currents. We were at the perfect distance for life to grow naturally, and both Mars and Earth were bathed in a perpetual warm glow. It's possible that even Mars had life at this stage in its history. As our star traveled through space, eventually it came into the vicinity of a different solar system with a much larger star, approaching at about 24 degrees to the ecliptic. When our small star came close enough into the field of this new star, it caused the brown dwarf to short circuit and released its electrical and thus gravitational hold on the Earth and Mars. As this was happening, the little dwarf star went through some extreme changes. Its electricity was going haywire, turning off and on, losing its energy, and it began discharging a tremendous amount of matter. The largest of all was a massive body of fiery material, which would become the planet Venus. When it discharged, it came out with sort of a backwards kick, explaining why it has a reverse rotation spin than all of the other planets. It is believed that it would have emerged out as a fireball with a greenish hue, but was destined to cool and solidify into the Venus we know today. Much of the other matter that it discharged may have even stayed in the orbit of the gas giant, giving it several large rings. What happens next is quite dramatic. Imagine being on the Earth as it topples through space into a new solar system looking for a sustainable orbit, with the inhabitants not knowing if they were going to survive or not as the universe whirled around them and only really seeing stars for the first time once free of the warm glow of the previous star. Wallace Thornhill, the chief science advisor for the Thunderbolts project, 
estimated that the transition from one sun to another would have taken about 300 years. As for Venus, it began acting as a comet, hurtling through the solar system at a phenomenal rate. And then something catastrophic happened as Mars and Venus gravitated dangerously close to each other. A massive discharge of electricity exploded between them. These planets were also fairly close to the Earth in proximity, and this event rained lightning and massive rocks down to our blue planet. This relates with a few things mythologically. First, it's theorized maybe this is why the goddess or feminine was often associated with green and the masculine and warrior deities with red due to the color of the stones crashing down from each planet. Further, there are a number of ancient myths describing a goddess raining fire or destruction down from the sky, such as Inanna in Sumeria, Hathor in Egypt, Kali in India, and more. We also speculate that if Mars did have life at this period in history, this could have been the event that blew away Mars's atmosphere, as opposed to the ideas we first put forth in the original human history movie. As for the small dwarf star, having short-circuited and lost its radiant red glow, it settled down to become a gas giant, which also found a new orbit behind Jupiter, and thus Saturn was born. The proponents of the electric universe theory suggest that this event was actually the terrifying battle of the dragon, which is a legend appearing around the world, including the story we've been exploring, Tiamat and Marduk, where in this version, Marduk was Mars and Tiamat was Venus. It is suggested that this event happened while there were humans on the planet, and those who survived this event were changed forever. Myths and religions were established, which described a story of creation and a battle of the gods, which we see the roots of in many world religions today. All over the world, we find this symbol. And just look at all of the versions of this. This image is believed to have been the polar configuration of these planets in alignment with each other, Mars, Venus, and Saturn, marking a shift for our planet forever. And now Venus, as terrifying as she would have been, would also have been magnificently beautiful to watch dance through the sky. It's possible that there are some connections here between her and several familiar characters in modern religious mythology. Venus is commonly known as the bright morning and evening star due to her appearance in the sky in the mornings and evenings just after the sun rises and sets. It's interesting because in Christianity, the morning star is a name given to both Jesus and Lucifer. And relating this to Venus, it could imply that she represents both beneficial and destructive qualities. This theory actually works in many ways, explaining why Earth, Mars, and Saturn all share a very similar tilt degree when compared to the other planets, which might imply that Neptune was also along for the ride, because it too has a fairly similar tilt degree. However, there is still a lot of mystery around the whole thing, because we don't yet have a definitive explanation of the other gods in the Babylonian story. For example, Lamu and Lahamu would no longer be Mars and Venus as they take on the role of Tiamat and Marduk. It also doesn't account for that large body way out in deep space, the thing we're calling Nibiru. What is that thing? The electric universe theory is a wildly interesting subject with a great deal of merit and potential to evolve the way we look at the universe. We'll likely continue to revisit these ideas throughout the series and more so in future episodes to come. For now, if you want to dive in, we highly recommend the brand new series called Electric Universe on Gaia, which features Wallace Thornhill, the chief science advisor of the Thunderbolts project, as they present the entire theory in a brilliant series of episodes. And you can find links to watch the entire thing in the comments below. Further, we would absolutely love to hear what you think about this entire theory. Between Sitchin's and the Electric Universe versions, which one do you like better? And do you think there's some way the two stories fit together? If you have some thoughts on these interpretations or additional research you'd like to share, please post them in the comments below. You see, at the end of the day, there are so many distinct renditions of this story, and I personally find so much joy and fascination in discussing them all. There's one version where Nibiru was believed to be in the place of the asteroid belt, and then it exploded for some reason or another. And another version where way out in deep space is not just a singular planet, but another small dwarf star that we are in a binary system with, 
of which that rogue Nibiru planet is just one of the planets orbiting that star. Since the tablets say that Nibiru was Marduk's star, maybe Marduk is the planet and Nibiru is the star. It's for this reason that we really want to encourage compassionate collaboration and discussion regarding all of these ideas. If we explore our history together with open minds and open hearts, not only will we make it significantly easier to make sense of our ancient past, but will also set us on a course for a more harmonious future for all of us. Before we bring this conversation to a close, I'd like to return to the idea of this exoplanet Nibiru for a moment, because there's a very important aspect of this that needs to be discussed. You see, whenever you start reading about all of these conspiracy theories on Nibiru, you find a lot of stuff like, Nibiru is coming next year, it will collide with the earth and kill us all. Or at the very least, equal to doom and gloom kind of stuff. Personally, I wanted to take a moment to dispel these rumors and say that Nibiru colliding with the planet is not something we need to be worried about. Even if the stories are true, and this rogue planet really does come into our solar system every 3,600 years, it wouldn't actually ever come close enough to our planet to cause a collision. It would only come as close as the asteroid belt. And sure, we'd probably see a lot of earthquakes and such from the gravity or electrical charge of Nibiru impressing itself upon the earth, but it wouldn't kill us all if we weren't prepared. That said, the astronomers currently don't see Planet X coming anywhere near us. And so I don't believe that's our most pressing concern at the moment. In fact, there's a much bigger concern we should all be focused on together. But before we can discuss that, we have to provide some more context first. At any rate, we have found that after reading Sitchin's work, the interpretations of other scholars and observing the anomalies in history and in our solar system, we've come to the conclusion that there is enough information here that this story deserves a big open discussion. We trust that as humanity evolves, we will continue to discover the true nature of our origins. The truth is, this story is only just getting started. Everything we've looked at so far is just the jumping off point for so much more. As we move forward, we begin to see these ancient gods interpreted in new ways, no longer as if they were planets, but actual beings who played a part in our history. The story shifts from looking at the planet and the solar system to looking at what happened on the Earth. The tablets tell a story about the deities known as the Anunnaki, which many people today believe were actual beings that came to our planet and played a role in the creation of humanity. Who are these beings? And did they really create people? Find out next time on Spirit Science. Enter the Anunnaki.